Fish are divided into two major clades. We have the cyclostomata, which are the fish with circular mouths, and the nathostomata, which are the jawed fish. Nathostomata is further divided into chondrichthyes, the cartilaginous fish, and the osteichthyes, also known as the bony fish. The osteichthyes are then subdivided into actinopterygii, the ray finned fish, and sarcopterygii, also known as the lobe finned fish. Now we as humans fall into sarcopterygii, which means that we're actually highly modified fish. So the first group of fish within cyclostomata are the hagfish. These are benthic scavengers that barely resemble what most would consider fish. They lack scales, and their skeleton is entirely cartilaginous. They also lack vertebrae, and instead have a basic notochord that runs alongside the spinal cord. One of the unique features of the hagfish is their ability to produce copious amounts of slime. The slime glands secrete an extremely hydrophilic molecule, which is able to absorb water from the surrounding environment to produce a large volume of slime. This is used as a deterrent so that it can evade predators. It's also used to lubricate its scaleless skin and prevent abrasive injury. The image on the top right is a radiograph of what you could call the skull. It's actually just an amalgam of cartilaginous elements. So here's an image that exemplifies the slime producing capabilities of hagfish. So this was a collision that occurred in the state of Oregon involving a truck that was transporting thousands of these hagfish. When the hagfish were released onto the pavement, they were naturally quite stressed and started producing copious amounts of slime. The next group within cyclostomata are the lampreys. Now there are parasitic and filter feeding variants of lampreys. The parasitic variants are able to bore through the skin of fish and feed on blood and tissue fluid. Some of them live in freshwater habitats, while others are anadromous, which means that they live in the marine environment, but move into freshwater habitats to spawn. The young grow up in the freshwater environment for a couple of years before maturing into adults and moving back into the marine environment. Now this is actually an invasive species in the Great Lakes. Originally, they were quite limited in their distribution. However, because of a series of artificial channels that were built in the Great Lakes to connect the lakes together for ship traffic, they found their way into lakes that they did not previously inhabit, and now they're wreaking havoc on the local fisheries in the area. So as previously mentioned, the chondrichthians are the cartilaginous fish. So this group includes the sharks, skates, rays, and chimeras. Now you probably haven't come across a chimera before, because they're deep sea dwelling animals. But one of the unique features of the chimera is the cephalic tentaculum, which is present in males. Now the cephalic tentaculum looks exactly like it sounds. It's essentially a spiny baton on the forehead, which the male uses to latch onto the female during copulation. The chondrichthian skeleton is entirely cartilaginous, save for the teeth. Sharks have multiple rows of teeth, which are shed regularly, which is one of the reasons why fossilized shark teeth are so common. Sharks don't have any ribs, and their skin is covered in dermal denticles. These aren't true scales, they're tooth-like structures composed of a dense crystalline material known as apatite, which gives it a sandpaper-like texture. Sharks don't have a swim bladder. Instead, they maintain neutral buoyancy via active and passive means. Active buoyancy is maintained via the heterocircle tail, which just means that the tail is asymmetrical, wherein the dorsal aspect of the tail is a bit longer than the ventral aspect of the tail. Now what this does is instead of generating thrust on a horizontal plane, it has somewhat of a downward trajectory. In so doing, it pushes the caudal end of the shark down relative to the cranial end of the shark, which in the end keeps it in a horizontal orientation. Passive buoyancy is maintained via a fatty liver, given that lipid is less dense than water. Now there are advantages and disadvantages to this form of buoyancy. One of the disadvantages is that if the shark is emaciated, then the liver is no longer fatty and as a result, it will be unable to maintain neutral buoyancy. One of the advantages of using a fatty liver is that the shark is able to inhabit a wider range of depths compared to fish with swim bladders, given that gas-filled organs are highly susceptible to pressure changes. The jaws of the shark are a derivative of the first and second branchial arches. The palatal quadrate and Meckel's cartilage are of the first branchial arch. These are supported by the hyomandibular and the serratohyal cartilages of the second branchial arch. In higher vertebrates, the first and second branchial arches are responsible for the bones of the inner ear, including the malleus, incus, and stapes, 
which means that the jaws of the shark are actually homologs of the bones of the inner ear. Sarcopterygii, also known as the lobefin fish, includes the coelacanth and the lungfish. Now, the coelacanth is what is referred to as a living fossil. It was thought to be extinct since the Cretaceous period. However, in 1938, a museum curator discovered it off the coast of South Africa. The African lungfish pictured on the top left and the Australian lungfish pictured on the bottom are representatives of dipnoi, which is a group of air-breathing fish that are the ancestors of tetrapods. Members of dipnoi are facultative and obligate air breathers. Most representatives have paired lungs, or in the case of the Australian lungfish, it has a single lung. The lung is a diverticulum off the ventral aspect of the esophagus. The lungs are fairly primitive. It's just a set of complex chambers, but it is homologous to the tetrapod lungs. A histological section of the lung can be seen in the image on the bottom right. Lungfish have vestigial gills. In the Australian lungfish, they are still functional in gas exchange, but for the most part, the gills are only useful in the excretion of nitrogenous wastes. Lungfish have the ability to estivate, which is a form of hibernation that occurs in the summer when water is scarce. So as the pond or slough begins to dry up, the lungfish can lower its metabolism and convert ammonia, which is highly toxic, into urea, which allows them to store nitrogenous wastes until water becomes available again. The image on the top right is the skeletal structure of the lobe fins. As you can see, the bones that make up the tetrapod limbs are actually present. So we have the clavicle, the scapula, the humerus, the radius, and the ulna. All of the other fin rays would then go on to evolve into the carpals, the metacarpals, and the phalanges. The group Chondrostei, which is one of the more basal groups in Ectinopterygii, includes the sturgeon and the paddlefish. They have a cartilaginous skeleton with mild ossification. Generally, they have a smooth skin with bony plates. The sturgeon is highly valued for its meat and caviar. As a result of this high price, land-based aquaculture, which is very expensive, is a reasonable means of production. Cladistia is another basal group in the ray-finned fish, and this includes the subgroup Polypteridae, which includes the bisher and the reedfish. The bisher is characterized as having multiple dorsal finlets and fleshy pectoral fins. They have ganoid scales and paired lungs. Scale structure will be covered later. Members of this group are facultative air breathers, and they have a pair of spiracles on the rostrum, which they use for air breathing. Neopterygii is the largest group within the ray-finned fish, and it includes holostei and teleostei. Holostei includes the bowfin and the gar. These fish have cartilaginous skeletons, but they also have dermal bone. Many of the elements of the bony skull are recognizable as homologous to the bones of the tetrapod skull, including the maxilla, the dentary, the parietal, and the temporal. They have ganoid scales and a swim bladder, which is modified for facultative air breathing and is connected to the esophagus via the pneumatic duct. Teleostei is the largest group within Neopterygii, with some 26,000 species. They have bony skeletons and tenoid and cycloid scales. Now a unique feature of the teleost is the protrusible jaws. So the bony elements of the skull are connected by a series of hinges, this makes the skull very kinetic. This allows them to protrude their jaws while increasing the volume of the buccal cavity. This creates a negative pressure, which allows them to suck up prey given the high viscosity of water. So here's a clip of the sling jaw wrasse, which takes this adaptation to the extreme. So within teleostei, we have a number of other groups. Just to highlight some of the important ones, we have allopomorpha, which are the true eels. Then we have osteoglossomorpha, which includes the arapaima and the arowana. These are facultative air-breathing fish that you would find in the Amazon and in Southeast Asia. Within clupiocephala, we have otocephala and euteleoste. Within otocephala, we have the clupiforms, which include the herring. This is an important food source. We then have the sapriniforms, which include the minnows, the tench, and the carp, like the goldfish. The chirassiforms include the tetras and the piranhas. These are popular aquarium fish. The gymnotiforms include the knifefish and the electric eel, which are not true eels. 
The Saluriforms are also known as the catfish. Within Euteleoste, we have the Salmoniforms, which include salmon and trout. These are a very important food source. The Asociforms include the pike, the Osmeriforms include the smelts, and Neoteleoste is essentially a trash bin clade that contains all of the other fish you can think of. As for the external anatomy, everything caudal to the gills is scale and fin, but it's good to know which fin is which, because when it comes to biometrics, you need to know your landmarks. The caudal fin is responsible for propulsion in most species of fish. There are some fish within reflex settings that use the pectoral fins for propulsion, but for the most part, the pectoral fins are there as a stabilizer to keep the fish properly oriented in the water column. The pelvic fin is not exactly within the pelvic region, this fin is highly mobile, so depending on the species, it will be further up by the chin or further back by the anal fin. The anal fin is caudal to the vent. As for the dorsal fins, we have the more cranial spinous portion, which has protective spines, and the softer rayed caudal portion. In the head region, we have the maxilla and the dentary, which make up the upper and lower jaws. And caudal to that, we have the operculum, also known as the gill cover. This protects the gills. The lateral line is part of the neurosensory system, but we'll cover that later. Now this is the basic arrangement of fins, however depending on the species, each component is going to be modified or positioned differently, depending on the fish's needs. So in the flying gurnard, the pectoral fins are massively overdeveloped. The reason for this is not as the name suggests. It doesn't use these fins to fly, it actually fans them out when the fish is stressed, as a deterrent to startle predators. In the English sole, the arrangement of fins can be somewhat confusing, given that the fish is actually lying on its side. The integument consists of four main layers, including the cuticle, which is the superficial most layer. This is followed by the epidermis, the dermis, and the hypodermis. The cuticle is lost in routine histological preparations, but it consists of an amalgam of mucus, mucopolysaccharides, and sloughed epithelial cells. It also contains a number of protective elements, like immunoglobulins and lysozyme. The epidermis, which is located beneath the cuticle, is a stratified epithelium. The basic cell is the malpigian cell. Unlike birds and mammals, where we have a basal layer that gives rise to all of the overlying layers, in the fish, all of the layers of the epidermis are viable and capable of mitosis. So don't be surprised if you see mitotic figures within the superficial most layers. Embedded within the epidermis are large numbers of mucus cells which secrete the mucus coat. In certain species like cyprinids or the carp, you'll find club cells, also known as alarm cells. These cells secrete a type of pheromone which alarms other fish when the fish is stressed. The dermis consists of two layers, the stratum spongiosum and the stratum compactum. As the name suggests, the stratum spongiosum is composed of a loose network of connective tissue. Other components of the spongy dermis include the scales and the chromatophores. There are a number of different chromatophores within the fish, including melanophores, iridophores, erythrophores, and xanthophores. The stratum compactum is composed of a dense sheet of collagen. Beneath the dermis is the hypodermis, which consists of collagen, adipose tissue, and small blood vessels. There are three types of scales, which include the ganoid scale, the tenoid scale, and the cycloid scale. The ganoid scale is composed of bone, animal, and ganoin. These scales are interlocking scales, which are highly protective but rather inflexible, so they don't allow for much finesse. The tenoid scales and the cycloid scales are more highly evolved. These are lightweight scales that consist of collagen and calcium. They're overlapping but flexible, and you would find them in more evolved species of fish. They grow via concentric rings, but where the tenoid scale has spines on the posterior edge, the cycloid scale has a smooth edge. The skeleton of the fish is largely rib and fin ray. There are two types of skeletal muscle in the fish, including the red muscle and the white muscle. So the red muscle is aerobic. It is slow to contract, but it can sustain its contractions for a prolonged period of time so it does not tire very easily. The red muscles are generally located laterally from the midline for increased leverage. These muscles are highly vascularized, which makes them a good place for intramuscular injections. The white muscle is arranged into a series of myomeres. 
These are anaerobic muscles, meaning that they can contract very rapidly. However, they're quick to fatigue. The white muscle is divided into the apaxial musculature, which is dorsal to the transverse process of the vertebrae, and the hypaxial musculature, which is ventral to the transverse process of the vertebrae. As you've probably already guessed, the white muscle is generally used for escaping predators, whereas the red muscle is used for long-distance migration. The gill consists of four main components. The branchial arch is the main support, which gives rise to the gill rakers and the gill filaments. The gill rakers are cartilaginous and bony projections that project cranially towards the oral cavity. Their function is to protect the gills by capturing any debris in the water as it passes over the gill filaments. In filter feeding fish like anchovies and herring, these gill rakers are highly specialized to collect this debris as a food source, like zooplankton. The gill filaments project caudally, so with the flow of the water. These give rise to secondary gill lamellae to massively increase the surface area for gas exchange. Each gill filament is supported by a gill ray, which is a thin body filament. The function of the gill is threefold. It is responsible for gas exchange, specifically the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide. It's also responsible for the release of nitrogenous wastes and the exchange of water and ions via the chloride cells. The pseudobranch can be seen in the upper image, tucked away in the opercular cavity adjacent to the first gill arch. This is a specialized structure which receives blood from the first gill. It monitors the blood chemistry and adjusts respiration accordingly. The image on the bottom is a histological section of the pseudobranch. As you can see, it's highly vascularized with rows of capillaries lined by specialized epithelial cells. This is just a close-up of the gill lamellae. Labeled in red is the gill filament, which is supported by the gill ray. Arising from the gill filament are large numbers of highly vascularized gill lamellae. These are labeled in green. Along the base of the gill lamellae, we have brightly eosinophilic cells labeled in blue. These are the chloride cells used in ion exchange. One thing worth noting is that unlike ventilation in the terrestrial environment, Gill ventilation is energetically expensive, and that's because water is much more dense than air. In the aquatic environment, there is a syndrome known as respiratory distress syndrome, where the cost of gill ventilation is actually greater than the energy released by the extracted oxygen. Another means of respiration, which can be more cost-effective, is ram ventilation. So with ram ventilation, the fish holds its mouth open while swimming or facing a current, so the water passively flows across the gills without the need for ventilation. Fish have a two-chambered heart, which starts with the sinus venosus. This drains blood from systemic circulation and passes it to the atrium. The atrium pumps blood into the ventricle. The ventricle, which consists of a compact and spongy layer, then pumps blood into the conus arteriosus. The conus arteriosus converts the pulsatile flow of blood into a more smooth, continuous flow of blood through its elasticity. The circulatory system in the fish is pretty basic. However, there's one difference worth noting and that is that the fish has a renal portal system, which means that the blood drained from the tail goes through the kidney before it's collected and pumped back into the heart. So don't inject anything into the tail vein, because you'll be injecting a high dose of that substance directly into the kidney. The reticuloendothelial system is a decentralized component of the immune system, which consists of endothelial cells and macrophages within highly vascularized tissues, namely the kidney, the spleen, and the heart. The endothelial cells and macrophages line the vascular channels and constantly sample particulates, antigens, and foreign materials that are floating around in circulation. The reticular endothelial system is also responsible for the phagocytosis and recycling of senescent and damaged erythrocytes. So in the images below, on the left you'll see a normal heart. On the right, you'll notice that the endothelial cells lining the vascular channels throughout the heart are hypertrophied. Beneath the hypertrophied endothelial cells are inflammatory infiltrates, like macrophages and lymphocytes. These are involved in antigen presentation. Based on this histological change, you can infer that the immune system in the fish on the right is reactive. The gastrointestinal tract is fairly straightforward. The oral cavity and the opercular cavity are continuous. There's no predigestion, which means that the fish doesn't chew. They essentially swallow their prey whole. From the oral cavity, the food moves into the pharynx. 
In some species, the pharynx has pharyngeal teeth, which make sure that the prey item doesn't escape. From the pharynx, the food is passed into the esophagus and then onto the stomach. The stomach is subdivided into the same regions you'd expect to find in terrestrial vertebrates, including the cardia, the fundus, and the pylorus. Between the stomach and the intestine, there are blind-ended diverticula, known as the pyloric cica. The pyloric cica increase the surface area for digestion and nutrient absorption. Depending on the species of fish, the exocrine pancreas is either suspended within the mesentery or fused with the liver in what is known as a hepatopancreas. Here's an example of the highly modified pharyngeal teeth that you would expect to find in a moray eel. They essentially look like a second set of jaws. The gastrointestinal tract of elasmobranchs, including the sharks and the rays, is similar to that of bony fish, however there are slight differences, one of which is that the intestine is a spiral valve intestine. They also have what is known as a rectal gland. This is labeled in red. The rectal gland is involved in the excretion of excess sodium and chloride. This is what the spiral valve intestine looks like when you cut it open. As you can see, there's a valve that runs down the length of the intestine in a spiral-like fashion. The point of this is to slow down transit time and to increase the surface area for digestion and nutrient absorption. Now the liver is similar to what you would expect in higher vertebrates, where hepatocytes are arranged into trabeculae, which are separated by sinusoids. However, unlike higher vertebrates, the sinusoids of fish are not lined by Kupfer cells. Moreover, there's no obvious lobularity. There are, however, functional hepatic lobules, which are made evident when there is liver pathology. So in the image on the bottom right, you can see hypereosinophilic bands starting to manifest, and these represent areas of hepatic necrosis likely the result of hypoxic injury. The hepatocytes are involved in lipid and glycogen storage. The amount of lipid and glycogen that is normally stored within the hepatocytes varies considerably between fish species. As was mentioned previously, sharks tend to store an abundance of lipid within their hepatocytes. Some fish prefer to store lipids within adipose tissue, while the hepatocytes only contain glycogen. Within the hepatic trabeculae, we also have intracellular bile canaliculi, which lead into bile ducts and then carry bile into the gallbladder for storage. The kidney is divided into the head kidney and the trunk kidney. The head kidney is the more cranial portion and it largely consists of hematopoietic tissue. There are also interrenal glands, which are the equivalent of the adrenal glands. These glandular cells typically surround larger caliber vessels. Between the head kidney and the trunk kidney, there are the corpuscles of Stanius which is an endocrine organ involved in calcium homeostasis. The trunk kidney consists of a combination of hematopoietic tissue and the renal tubular system. So you'd see the various segments of the nephron interspersed with hematopoietic tissue. The nephrons drain the urine into the archinephric ducts, which are also known as the urinary ducts. These ducts carry the urine caudally to the urinary papillae, which open up at the vent. Another important component of the kidney are the melanomacrophage centers. These are dense aggregates of melanomacrophages, which contain melanin, lipofusin, and hemosiderin. These serve as the dumping sites for metabolic wastes. This is also part of the free radical scavenging system, given that melanin is good at absorbing free radicals. Increased numbers of melanomacrophage centers is usually evidence of increased cell turnover, which can be due to chronic toxin exposure. It could also be an indicator of old age, given that cells are regularly replaced and recycled throughout the life of the fish. The collection of glandular epithelial cells labeled in red is the interrenal gland. The hematopoietic tissue is labeled in green. The function of the spleen in fish is very similar to what one would expect in a mammal. It's an erythrocyte reserve that's also responsible for recycling damaged and senescent erythrocytes. It contains hematopoietic tissue primarily of the lymphoid lineage, but it can contain other lineages as well. The spleen also contains ellipsoids, which are lymphoid aggregates surrounding vessels, which respond to antigens that are present in circulation. It also contains melanomacrophage centers, much like in the kidney. The swim bladder is present in more evolved fish. This is a gas-filled organ that is necessary for buoyancy. Embryologically, it is derived from the foregut. There are two types of swim bladders. 
there's the physostomus swim bladder, which retains its connection with the foregut via the pneumatic duct. So these fish have to swallow air and pump it into the swim bladder via the pneumatic duct. Then there's the physoclistus swim bladder. In these fish, the pneumatic duct is lost, and gas is released from the blood via the gas gland into the gas-filled chamber. Gas is reabsorbed from the swim bladder at the oval, which is a highly vascularized plexus along the dorsal aspect of the swim bladder. The swim bladder can also be used in hearing as a drum or an amplifier. Many benthic species of fish sit on the ocean floor, so there's no need for a swim bladder. Instead, they have reinforced epidermis on the fins, or specialized fins for walking. This is to prevent abrasions of the epidermis, which is fairly delicate in fish. So most species of fish are dioecious, which means that they exist as separate sexes. In some species, you have simultaneous hermaphrodism, which means that they have both male and female gonads at the same time. Others are sequential hermaphrodites, like clownfish, so these fish will transition from one sex to another under certain conditions. Protoandry is defined as a fish that begins as a male and transitions into a female. Protogyne is the opposite, where they begin as females and transition into males. Fish can be oviparous, viviparous, or ovoviviparous, which means that they can be primarily egg producers, live bears, or produce eggs and then retain those eggs in the reproductive tract as they develop into embryos. In the image on the bottom left, we have an example of a sequential hermaphrodite, which is in the process of transitioning from male to female. The gonad largely consists of seminiferous tubules with scattered ova. Guppies are prolific breeders and ovoviviparous. In the image on the right, you can see the reproductive tract containing multiple sets of eyes. These are the developing embryos. In the male, the gonad is the testis, which produces spermatozoa. These are carried from the testes to the vas deferens, then released into the environment via the excretory meatus. The functional unit of the testis is the seminiferous tubule, which consists of Sertoli cells and the developing spermatozoa. Interspersed among the seminiferous tubules are the interstitial cells, which are responsible for hormonal production. In the female, the gonad is the ovary, in higher teleosts, the oviduct receives the ova from the ovary to be released into the environment. In lower teleosts, the ova develop within a fold in the mesentery, so they're free within the abdominal cavity. They're released into the environment via a genital opening. The functional unit of the ovary is the ovarian follicle, which consists of a central ovum that is surrounded by a zona pellucida and supported by granulosa cells. These cells provide nourishment for the developing ova and are responsible for hormonal production. The fish's brain is fairly straightforward, but there are some differences between fish and mammals that are worth noting. The medulla oblongata is responsible for the control of chromatophores. Unlike mammals where melanocytes are fixed, in fish, melanophores can increase and decrease in size. In so doing, they can change the degree of pigmentation. Within the central nervous system, there are large paired neurons known as the Mothner cells. These neurons are involved in the fast escape reflex. The axons of these neurons are so large that they can be seen on gross examination. These are highlighted in the bottom right image. In the eye, you have a spherical lens. Unlike mammals where the lens is deformable, in the fish the lens is rigid and fixed, so focus is achieved by moving the lens forward or backward by the retractor lentis muscle. Within the fish, you also have a choroid gland behind the eye, which monitors the blood chemistry. The labyrinthian system is responsible for sensing balance. This is a series of semicircular canals and chambers that are responsible for maintaining equilibrium within the water column. The lateral line system is unique to fish. This is a channel underneath the skin that is continuous with the external environment by a series of pores. Movement of water through the channel triggers the hairs of neuromass cells, which allows for mechanoreception. Any vibration in the water can be detected by the lateral line system. The ampullae of Lorenzini is a system of electroreceptors that is unique to sharks. These are little pits in the snout that contain a conductive gel. Any sort of electrical signal is conducted through the gel and passed onto the receptor cells. The system is so sensitive that a shark could detect the beating heart of a fish from behind a wall. There are a number of glands throughout the body, some of which have already been covered. 
The thyroid gland is dispersed in fish, unlike mammals, where it exists as a discrete organ. The thyroid gland is responsible for regulating carbohydrate metabolism and lipid mobilization. The ultimobranchial body secretes calcitonin, which is responsible for suppressing osteoclast function. It doesn't have any effect on plasma calcium. The function isn't clear, but it's believed to play a role in reproduction. The pituitary gland is involved in osmoregulation, metabolism, growth, and pigmentation. The pancreatic islets secrete insulin and glucagon. The interrenal gland is homologous to the adrenal gland, and it's responsible for secreting glucocorticoids, mineralocorticoids, and catecholamines. The corpuscles of Stanius secrete a hormone called teleocalcin, which blocks calcium absorption by the gills. The gonads are responsible for the production of androgens and estrogens. The image to the bottom right is an example of goiter in a fish.